Train Alone Day. It wasn't supposed to be like this, my big day. I was going to travel home alone on the train. We'd been working up to it for weeks, and now I was on the station, looking up at the departures board. My train was up there. It was on time. I was in control. Everything was just as it should be. I'd made the journey with Dad so many times. What could go wrong? The board flickered, went black, and when it came on again, it said, cancelled. It took me a while to realise what this meant. How could a train be cancelled? What happened to it? In my head, I could see the train disappear into a tunnel and never come out. Fear was beginning to build up inside me. I swallowed and took a deep breath. What would Dad do? Next train, wait for the next train. And then, as if the board knew what I was thinking, it flickered again and there were no departure times. Instead, next to each train, it said, cancelled, cancelled, cancelled. What was happening? I needed help. I pulled my phone from my rucksack. It felt smooth and safe. I pressed it open and tapped on Dad's name, and now it was ringing. He'd know what to do. Kerry, you OK? Dad's voice. Yes, I'm OK. It's just that the, the train's been cancelled, and what should I do? Silence. Dad, are you there? Silence. Dad, say something. Silence. I looked down at the phone. The screen was black, plain, boring, black. I pressed the screen, I pressed the buttons on the top, but it stayed black, dead black. Emily, my sister, had told me to charge it, but I hadn't. Instead, I'd played on my phone until midnight and fallen asleep with it on the duvet. Emily's only one year older than me and at uni. Dad and I had come on the train together last night. He showed me the ropes again, just like he did last week and the week before. Though that last one was a proper trial, because he just hung back out of sight in case I panicked. Dad left me with Emily and went out on a date. Emily thought it was great. He was seeing someone. This morning, Emily gave me a lift to the station and said she'd see me on the train. I told her I wasn't a baby. I told her she was ruining my train alone day. I was going to show them all I could do it. Perhaps Emily was still there. I rushed into the car park, but of course she'd already gone. Maybe I'd got it wrong. Maybe the train would be coming now. I ran back to the platform. A voice echoed round the station. Signal failure, signal failure, signal failure on all trains on the Northwest Line. Please wait for further information. I tried to keep calm, but my stomach was churning and I couldn't think properly. Panic, don't panic, that's what Dad always says. But I was living a disaster. This wasn't in the script. The rule is that if anything big goes wrong, I phone him. We didn't talk about what I should do if my phone broke or if it didn't work or ran out of battery. I suppose he didn't want to frighten me. I wanted to scream, cry and shout. I would have done but I noticed a woman further down the platform. The woman was waving at me. She was wearing a raincoat and pushing out from the bottom was what looked like a frilly pink nightie. And on her feet, she was wearing fluffy pink slippers. She was standing with two station men. I walked towards her. Do you know this woman? One of the men said. She's Mrs. Bennett from next door. Mrs. Bennett pulled my arm and I bent down so she could whisper in my ear, they're going to kidnap me. I knew it wasn't true. It was her dementia speaking. She picked up the basket that was next to her slippers and said, let's go home, dear. I wanted to ask the men about the train, but they were walking away. Mrs. Bennett was shuffling towards the yellow line at the edge of the platform. I rushed over to her and tugged her to safety. She took my hand and held it tight. Poor woman, I want to go home. Take me home, Kerry, please. There's no trains, Mrs. Bennett. They've all been cancelled. I thought she'd be worried, but instead she smiled and looked straight at me. No trains? Well, what about the bus? Of course, the bus. Why hadn't I thought of that? I picked up the basket, and it was only then I noticed what was inside. 
It was Jeremy, Mrs. Bennett's cat, and he wasn't happy. When I tried to stroke him through the mesh, he hissed. He wants to go home. He doesn't like those kennels. He got in a bit of bother, and they said he couldn't stay. She started to walk out of the station, and I had to go with her to keep her safe, didn't I? Down one street, then another and another, round corners across roads. It wasn't until I saw the same shop for the fourth time that I knew that Mrs Bennett's dementia meant she didn't know the way to the bus station. It's not far. I know it's here somewhere, she said. I sat down on the wall in front of a shop. I was exhausted. We must have walked for miles and Jeremy's cage was heavy. He kept on moving about inside, which made it almost impossible to carry. We waited together, me and Mrs Bennett and her pink nighty and fluffy slippers. A drop of rain fell and another and another until it was tipping down. Mrs Bennett's slippers looked like Jeremy when Dad had pulled him out of the pond after he'd been fishing. I had to do something, but what? A bus came by. I watched as it splashed through a puddle and headed down the road. Mrs Bennett waved a hand. Why didn't it stop, she said. There's no bus stop. And then I thought about where it was going, and it came to me. It must be going to the bus station. So I picked up Jeremy with one hand and grabbed Mrs Bennett's hand with the other and followed the bus. Round the corner was the bus station. Mrs Bennett was excited. I knew the way. Didn't I tell you I knew the way? We looked on every stand until we found the right bus. It was ready to go. Together we got on. Everyone was staring at us. I suppose we did look odd, especially the nighty and those slippers. Two to Bolton, please. It's not cheap going on the bus, so I had to delve down to the bottom of my rucksack to get out the envelope Dad had given me. Money for emergencies. I tore it open and took out a crisp £10 note. Sorry, love, two tickets are £12. I wanted to plead with him, but I couldn't think of what to say, and now a man was shouting at us. Some of us have homes to go to. Mrs Bennett was bending down towards those slippers. It was so embarrassing. I grabbed her arm, picked up Jeremy, and together we tumbled off the bus. What did you do that for? She seemed cross. I know it's somewhere. She sat down on the pavement and took off one slipper, tipped it up and peered inside. Now she was doing the same with the other one. She reached inside. Here it is. I knew it was somewhere. Her bus pass. The doors of the bus were closing. I hammered on the door. The bus driver looked at me and rolled his eyes. I gave him the bus pass and the £10 note. As the tickets squirmed out of the machine, Mrs Bennett clambered aboard with the slippers in one hand and Jeremy in the other. The bus was moving now, and we sat down on the front seats. I kept my head down, sure that everyone would be looking and laughing at us. Mrs Bennett was chatting two for a dozen, as Dad would say. Isn't this fun, Kerry dear, a bus ride together? I knew it was rude not to listen, but it was all so terribly embarrassing. A man leant over towards me. What's he called? I looked blank. I thought he was going to tell us off, so it took me a while to get what he was talking about. I needn't have worried, because Mrs Bennett was already answering. He's called Jeremy after my dad who was in the Navy. What's your dad called? She didn't wait for an answer, but kept on talking and talking and talking. I looked out of the window, pretending I wasn't with Mrs Bennett and worrying about how we'd know when we'd reached our stop. It was a good job too, because there was the park with the bandstand and there was our bus stop slipping by. I stood up and walked over to the driver. You've missed our stop. We need to get off. I couldn't believe this was happening. So close. And now we were going in the wrong direction. You'll have to wait until the next stop. Mrs Bennett was still chatting to the stranger when the bus stopped and I helped her and Jeremy get off. We walked slowly back to the park. My feet were killing me. All we had to do was nip round the bandstand and up the path. You can imagine how pleased I was when we reached our street. As we walked towards my house, Mrs Bennett's Lucy came running up in a terrible fluster. Oh, Kerry, you're a hero. You found her and brought her here. And she kissed me before bundling poor old Mrs Bennett into her car and putting Jeremy in the boot and speeding away. Our house looked empty. I knocked on the door and rang the doorbell, but nobody came. I went round the back and took the key from under the flower pot and let myself in. The kitchen was quiet. 
and I felt absolutely alone. Where was Dad? How could he leave me? Then I remembered my phone. I plugged it into the charger and watched as the battery shape filled with red lines then burst into life. There were loads of missed calls from Dad and four messages on the answer phone. I listened to the last one. Kerry, phone me. I guess you've run out of battery or signal. Phone me when you get this straight away. I'm coming to get you. Stay where you are. Promise? It wasn't me panicking, it was him. I pressed reply to his call and waited for the ring. At last, Dad answered. Kerry, where are you? The kitchen. Don't move. I'll be there in 20 minutes. Less. And he hung up. My feet hurt. I slipped into the chair by the kitchen table and that's when I noticed the cake. It had a picture of a train and written in red icing with the words, Happy Train Alone Day.